Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, and we also want to let you know that we're sponsored today by Simply Safe Home Security. Protect your home the smart way without the expensive long term contracts using Simply Safe Home Security. Visit simplysafe.com slash ricochet. That's spelled S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash ricochet. And more on there. Great products a little bit later in our podcast. Jim, we start with the good martini, of course, and we begin with the first day of weekly business. I don't know how we define day one anymore. Apparently there's a controversy about that, but we're not going to spend any time worrying about it. The first Monday, let's just say at that, of the Trump administration uh, has uh, had some activity. There were three executive orders signed on Monday. There are actually a couple other important things that happened even before that, like the president signing an executive order, I believe the day he was sworn in, ordering all federal agencies to ease the burden of Obamacare, essentially giving people in the administration the power to do what the secretary was granted to do in Obamacare to set up all sorts of uh, regulations and fees and penalties and all that sort of thing. Well, now that same discretion can be used to go in the opposite direction. So that's a good thing. Uh, He also reinstated the Mexico City policy, which forbids federal tax dollars being used to pay for overseas abortions. Uh, He also instituted a hiring freeze for federal workers outside of the military and law enforcement and and health emergency response and that sort of thing. The other thing he did, of course, was uh, TPP, withdrawing the United States from that. That's a little more uh, divisive, a little more controversial on the right and on the left. And uh, while I don't believe it's happened at the time we're recording here, he's expected today uh, to greenlight the Keystone XL and the Dakota Access pipelines, uh, which is happening in two days in this administration, which uh, took almost eight years to make a decision on in the last administration. So, Jim, while there's certainly a couple of controversial issues in there, for the most part, a pretty good start. Yeah, a lot to like, uh, a couple uh, bones to pick here and there. By the way, I think it's probably just the easiest way to describe it is the first working weekday of the <laughs> Trump presidency. Look, nobody's going to get that much done on Inauguration Day. You got to run out. You got to attend all the balls. You got to do all this. Nobody's going to give them that much gripe about it. And let's face it, that first day back from vacation, Greg, how much work do we get done? <laughs> Not a lot. Not that much, right? You kind of ease yourself into it. So, um, probably at the top of the list, we should point out the the Mexico City policy. This is basically saying no U.S. funds can go to a, uh, a family planning organization that either does abortions or that lobbies against. Uh, uh, restrictions on abortions in their host countries. Um, this is something that uh, that uh, that was in in place during Republican administrations. Then Clinton got rid of it. Then George W. Bush brought it back. Then Obama got rid of it. And now two days in, Trump has done this. I kind of feel like somewhere either we don't have to do it directly in the resolute desk, Greg. <laughs> But considering how consistently Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have turned this policy on and off, I would just like to add it to a light switch in the Oval Office. <laughs> just go in there, flick, and it's on, flick, it's off. It's pretty consistent. Um, the hiring freeze for federal workers, I saw Evan McMullen, uh, who has decided that his uh, short-lived uh, independent conservative presidential bid will now turn him into a career of being a loud critic of Trump on everything, <laughs> uh, was saying, look, the hiring freeze doesn't really deal with the deficit and the debt. It's not, you know, yeah, no, that's... You're right. I don't know if Trump said the hiring freeze is going to single-handedly deal with the spending problem. Um, yes, it's about entitlements. If I'd lo- you know, I, I sure as heck would love to see the Trump administration take a tougher line on entitlements. But that doesn't mean any effort to restrict—I you know, I don't want to boo any effort from the Trump administration to try to control spending. <laughs> right? Give them encouragement when it's in the right direction. Now, I think it's important to note that the Trump uh, executive order gave them—it sounds to me like a pretty broad leeway— uh, for for ignoring the hiring freeze if it relates to national security or public safety. I don't know about you, Greg. I don't want the CIA and the NSA having a lot of unfilled jobs right now. <laughs> right. Uh, it does not apply to the military. Military recruitment can keep on going. Uh, and I also think it's important for public safety. You know, for places like the National Institutes for Health. Hey, you know what? Keep working on the flu vaccine, guys. I I because you know a bunch of folks I know caught the flu this year's. Flu vaccine is terrible, and uh, <laughs> go, go back to the drawing board, guys. Don't you know, I don't want to see a lot of empty em, empty offices there. Um, and yes, this is you know they're supposed to go on for 90 days while they review put together a more structured plan 
uh, for reducing waste and inefficiency and, and uh, uh, duplicative offices in the federal government. I think as long as this is kind of a short term way of sending a signal to the federal bureaucracy, the era of endlessly increasing budgets is, is, is over. I have no problem with it. The only problem comes when if you end up saying having all of your all the guys who fix the machines at, at one particular U.S. mint <laughs> retire, <laughs> and suddenly you don't have any guys and you don't have anybody to replace them. So, uh, you know, you, you, this is this is correct. It's not a long term solution, but I do like it as sending a symbolic uh, message there. Um, and then finally on TPP, uh, Greg, who would have guessed that on the you know the fourth or the first real working day of the Trump administration, some of the people cheering the loudest would be Bernie Sanders and Richard Trumka of the AFL CIO and Jimmy Hoffa of the Teamsters and all the other organized labor. Uh, I realize this is an issue that divides the, uh, uh, the the Republicans and Democrats. I realize this was an issue that Hillary Clinton said she opposed. You know, Barack Obama could not get support for this. Uh, this trade deal at all, um, I think it indicates how much the 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 battle lines and you know we talk about an era of endless partisanship, but here is an issue that really splits the parties, um, and kind of an unexpected development in the first couple of days of the Trump administration. If you're a child of the '80s or I guess early '90s, really, you'll enjoy Jim's headline on that story in today's Morning <laughs> Jolt. Uh, so good work there, Jim. Uh, on to the bad martini now, and even in the very final hours of the Obama administration. He's doing things to make us bang our head against the desk. And Charles Krauthammer and others have uh, pointed out how Obama's true colors shown after the election and his uh, stiff arming Israel at the U.N. and the wet foot, dry foot policy and so many other things uh, that really uh, were kind of a finger in the eye or just maybe a middle finger to those who are not fans of the president. He just didn't care anymore. But here's apparently the last salvo, at least that we know of. This is courtesy of the Free Beacon. Hours before President Donald Trump took the oath of office, the Obama administration directed $221 million to be sent to the Palestinian Authority, undercutting Republican opposition in Congress to the money transfer. The State Department, still under the helm of Secretary of State John Kerry at the time, informed GOP members of Congress of the action on the morning of President Trump's inauguration, according to the Associated Press. A State Department official and several congressional aides said the outgoing administration formally notified Congress it would spend the money Friday morning, the official said former Secretary of State John Kerry, former has a nice ring to it when it deals with John Kerry, had informed some lawmakers of the move shortly before he left the State Department for the last time Thursday. Uh, the story goes on to say that the Palestinian uh, funds had been initially approved by Congress in 2015 and 2016, but a group of Republican lawmakers, including the head of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, objected to it and usually those holds, while not binding, are usually respected by the executive branch. In this case, the president just decided not to honor that. Oh, and by the way, the administration also released $4 million for climate change initiatives and $1.25 million for a variety of U.N. programs. So, Jim, uh, antagonism until the last moment, apparently. Usually those uh, holds are honored, but YOLO! <laughs> you only live once. You're only president once. What are you going to do, impeach me? You know, um, I, I'm just going to make an observation that... that, that Really, for a long time in our, our nation's history, there really hasn't been any serious effort to limit the power of a lame duck president. Uh, it's just kind of built into the system. You are president until noon on Inauguration Day. And you can, you know, all the powers you had on your first day, you have until the last minute of the last day. If you see enough stunts like this being pulled, you're going to see an effort to try to restrict the powers of the president between Election Day and Inauguration Day. And I don't think that's a constitutionally good idea. I don't think that um, uh, this is something we need a legal change on or you know, hard cases make bad law. If presidents start like doing everything they can right before they get out the door, things they would never do before Election Day because they know it's unpopular, they know it would be a backlash, you know the public does not support this, um, you're going to seek, you know, efforts to try to restrict the powers of the president. I don't think this is a good idea. Obviously, we only need to worry about this every four to eight years. But, um, you know, there's this is one of those things that is kind of common law or tradition and doesn't need to be written down. But everyone needs to act with a certain sense of honor um, and to recognize that your era is ending and you don't, you know, the new guy is going to be coming in and making decisions. And a lot of those decisions you're not going to like, but you can't try to ram through as much as possible. 
um, you know, particularly in terms of spending the next day. And of course, the good news is, Greg, we can just deduct it from their aid for next year, right? <laughs> yes, hopefully. I don't know if that'll actually happen, but assuming there is any aid for next year, right? <laughs> There's so many other things, though. We didn't mention offshore drilling ban that the president put into place, gobbling up federal lands out west, or adding land to the federal register out west, uh, just on and on and on. Uh, and absolutely, this president has been more aggressive. I don't think I could tell you one thing George W. Bush did that was uh, controversial in his last couple months in office. His dad did send troops into Somalia, but with the blessing of a uh, president like Clinton at the time, and that was supposed to only be a humanitarian mission. Didn't quite end up that way. Anyway, let's talk about Simply Safe Home Security, because they are not uh, pulling any shenanigans here at the last second. You know that you're getting good stuff with Simply Safe. And in early January, by the way, the Consumer Electronics Show wrapped up out in Las Vegas. The CES is this incredible trade show. I think most of you know about it. All the big tech companies unveil their newest innovations. It's really like seeing the future in front of your eyes. Now, the sponsor of the Three Martini Lunch podcast, Simply Safe Home Security, was there. And they had one of the most talked about products at the show, the new Simply Safe security camera. It connects to the sensors in your alarm system. So if an intruder tries to break in, the camera will automatically start recording. Then not only will your Simply Safe call the police, but you'll have actual evidence. So when the police arrive, you can say, here's the guy. It is incredible. And if the police don't do anything about it, you can hire bounty hunters to go get them. No, you wouldn't have to do that. But think about how great it is not just to tell the police I've been robbed, somebody tried to break into my house, but you have a photo of the guy making the police work that much easier. Yeah, yeah, definitely a huge tool to uh, cracking down on crime in your home and, and, and any home that has this uh, incredible device, the Simply Safe security camera. You can check in at home anytime, anywhere. You don't even have to be there. Just live stream HD footage directly to your smartphone. Plus, with Simply Safe, there are never, ever any expensive long term contracts. If you want to see for yourself what Simply Safe's brilliant technology can do for your home, visit simplysafe.com slash ricochet. That's spelled S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash ricochet. You'll even get their special 10% discount. That's only at simplysafe.com slash ricochet. Fantastic. All right, let's move on to our crazy martini now. And Jim, as most of our listeners are probably aware, two of Trump's cabinet nominees got approved the day he was sworn in. That was Mattis for defense and Kelly at uh, Homeland Security. They wanted Mike Pompeo to be confirmed the same day. That didn't happen. It happened on Monday evening. And Pompeo, the former now congressman from Kansas, was confirmed by a vote of 66 to 32 after Senate Democrats forced a three-day delay arguing that the critical post deserved a thorough debate. And we'll have a potential theory on why the vote ended up the way it was in just a minute, Jim. But, you know, we've got controversial, and to use that in quotation marks, uh, controversial nominees, supposedly from the Democratic perspective, like Sessions, like Price, uh, maybe Betsy DeVos. Mike Pompeo was supposed to be a slam dunk. I can't think that his uh, dismissal of Kamala Harris's climate change concerns rallied 32 Democrats to vote against him. But if 32 Democrats don't like Mike Pompeo, uh, there's not a lot of cooperation that's going to happen in this next four years. Yeah. And a couple of days after Trump wins the election, right, and the whole country, you know, certainly every Democrat is in shock, right? And they are uh, they're, they're horrified. They're scared. They're angry. They feel like the apocalypse is upon us, right? And I believe Pompeo was one of Trump's first uh, a major announced uh, cabinet nominees. And I was saying to people who were out on the ledge, look, it's not the end of the world. Um, and that Mike Pompeo is a pretty, you know, um, respectable, straight arrow kind of guy. This guy is a grown up. Does this mean I'm going to agree with every decision he makes? Probably not. Uh, does this mean Democrats are going to agree with a lot of his decisions? Probably not either. But um, if you found Michael Flynn to be too much of a conspiracy theorist, if you found other people around Trump to be unnerving or um, deplorable, to use a popular term in the past year, you know, Mike Pompeo is not one of those guys. Uh, and the job of the CIA director is supposed to be, well, let's say, relatively nonpartisan, uh, certainly going to be aligned with the thinking of uh, the administration. But by and large, their job is to you know gather data, gather intelligence, gather information and present the best information, the clearest, most accurate uh, information to the president, to his cabinet and to the Congress to make the best decisions possible. I, I was going to say there aren't a lot other than you know, other than maybe Mattis. Um, I, I'm not sure how many other picks would be any more reassuring than Pompeo. 
So if 32 Democrats are going to vote no on Pompeo, I think it's safe to say 32 are going to vote against every single one of Trump's nominees. <laughs> and if that's the way the game's going to be played, fine. You know, someday there will be a Democratic nominee and you can count on the, major the vast majority of Republicans in the Senate to vote against every single one of those nominees. Because I don't think Pompeo said anything in his uh, confirmation hearings or, or past statements or past history in the House that would make you think this guy is some sort of unhinged uh, uh, radical who's going to, you know, act out some sort of dystopian or Orwellian fantasy. Um, it's really unnerving that, you know, if you're if you're the Democrats, you probably want to find at least a couple of these nominees who you can live with and say, OK, out of all the Trump, if you believe that um, Rex Tillerson is terrible, then you concentrate your fire on Rex Tillerson and you say this is this is a bad pick. If you want to say uh one of the the treasury, you know, one of the other, you, you can only focus your fire so much because when all of the picks are the worst possible pick ever, then none of the picks are the worst possible pick ever. Um, Pompeo looked like a slam dunk, and clearly he got more, you know, plenty of votes. But uh, it, it to me, it suggests that the Democrats have not figured out how to focus. They have not figured out how to uh, prioritize, and they just simply want to. They're they're still in the primal scream stage of opposition to Trump, and the country uh, deserves better. And I think at this moment it needs better. Um, there are serious objections to be made to about Trump and the way he's doing things in his early administration. I don't think picking Mom, Mike Pompeo is 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 one of those strong objections. No, and even the Democrats uh, wouldn't dare delay the nomination of James Mattis. They uh, there was no fight over that because the last thing you want is him pleading. With tears in his eyes. But <laughs> that would not turn out well for Democrats. So what happened with Mike Pompeo? Well, according to Steve Hayes, uh, the brand new, congratulations to him, editor-in-chief of the Weekly Standard, uh, he has a pretty good minute-to-minute uh, -minute here. The Senate reconvened, he says, after the inaugural ceremonies on Friday with Pompeo's nomination set to come up at 4.50 p.m., Tom Cotton of Arkansas angrily confronted Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer about his broken promise because Schumer had originally promised that the Pompeo vote would be on Inauguration Day. According to witnesses, Schumer told Cotton to lower his voice and asked him to move off the Senate floor to an adjacent hallway for a private discussion. We need to take this out into the hallway, Schumer said. Cotton walked with Schumer but loudly rejected his first request. Don't tell me to lower my voice, he shouted, with an additional salty admonition tacked on for emphasis. Sen Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Richard Burr and Texas Senator John Cornyn were present, as was Virginia Senator Mark Warner, ranking member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and several aides. Schumer told Cotton that the Senate had never previously confirmed a CIA director on Inauguration Day, and if Cotton had been around eight years earlier, he'd know that Republicans didn't extend that courtesy for incoming President Barack Obama. Cotton's response, quote, eight years ago, I was getting my butt shot at in Afghanistan. So don't talk to me about where I was eight years ago. Cotton asked Schumer why he'd gone back on his word. Schumer claimed that he'd only been speaking for himself when he promised to let Pompeo through. The Republicans were stunned. I'm not telling Ron Wyden to do this, Schumer declared. Why don't you go talk to Wyden? That's not my job, Chuck, said Senator Burr. I know what you promised me, said Burr. You made the deal. Burr, not known for his aggressiveness, pointedly told Schumer that Republicans had learned something important about taking Schumer at his word, quote, I won't make that mistake again. Jim, Tom Cotton, don't mess with him. <laughs> this way, for perspective, uh, after this exchange, General Mattis said, man, don't mess with that guy. <laughs> we will see how this shakes out. Um, again, I, I don't see, you know, you have to pick your hills to, to die on, and, and you kind of have to, you know, ask the question, was Mike Pompeo really the biggest and most consequential fight that, that Ron Wyden and the other Senate Democrats wanted to have? Um, if, if their attitude, because this is the sort of thing that gets filibusters nuked, right? This is the sort of thing that gets, you know, the majority party to say, you guys are being unreasonable. There's no talking to you. There's no reasonableness there. Uh, there's no willingness to be conciliatory or work together. We're just going to steamroll you. And for the sake of the way our, our, our democracy operates, our constitutional republic operates, you'd like to see this kind of tension minimized. But this requires a little bit of give. And the idea that Wyden's going to be the guy who holds this up, particularly when Schumer said, don't worry, we're going to do this, unnerving. But uh, I was going to say, for people who want to see a fighting spirit in Senate Republicans, I think they got it. <laughs> 
Yeah, if there's anything uh, that's good that congressional Republicans can pick up from Donald Trump, uh, it's not just playing nice and, and seeing lots of opportunities go by the wayside because of procedure or holds or whatever. I mean, the Democrats are still going to use whatever powers they can being in the minority, uh, but it looks like there's uh, more of a fighting spirit uh, in the congressional GOP, and that could be a very good thing given what uh, is potentially able to be accomplished here in the first couple of years of this administration. Indeed. Jim, fun day. A lot of, uh, lot of fighting here. This is good. Talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> see, you, see you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. And don't forget to visit our friends at Simply Safe Home Security and learn more about that amazing new Simply Safe security camera. Head to simplysafe.com slash ricochet. S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E dot com slash ricochet.